morning. My name is Rika, a, Mol a member of Mullins Church, um, and our passage today is Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 56. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women! And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Thank you, Rika. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wonder um, how many times you have said Happy Christmas to somebody already this year. Hands up if you've said Happy Christmas to at least one person this year. If you haven't, please say Happy Christmas to me now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hands up if you've said it more than ten times. Hands up if you've written it so many times in cards that your wrist is starting to ache uh, a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Um, um, you, we want to have a happy Christmas, don't we? And we want everybody else to have a happy Christmas too. But how do we actually do it? Well, this morning we're going to do some surveys. You should have those mysterious letter cards uh, on your pews. Uh, and they should be labelled A, B, C and D. And don't worry, they have been sanitised. Uh, now, over the course of this morning, I'm going to give you the chance to vote on a few different questions. So here is the first question we're going to go for. What is the most important thing we need to have a happy Christmas? What's the most important thing we need for a happy Christmas? Here are your options. A, presents. We need lots of presents for a happy Christmas. B, food. We need lots of food, especially lots of chocolate for a happy Christmas. C, rest. We need a break from work and school. We need to play games and take walks and sing carols and relax. Or D, family. We need to spend time with family members to truly have a happy Christmas. Okay, vote now. Interesting, interesting. Lots of C's, lots of D's, lots of A's. I think... Oh, it's fairly evenly split between um, food and family, which is interesting. Okay, vote is down. Well, all of those things are absolutely great, aren't they? And they can give us a really fun Christmas day and a lovely Christmas holiday. But I wonder if you agree with me that there are one or two problems with these things. The first problem is that this year, in 2020, we can't have some of those things. We love to enjoy singing Christmas carols in our church meetings, but we can't do it. And many of us can't even see our families this year. 2020 has been a really hard year for all sorts of reasons, and so perhaps we're not expecting a very happy Christmas this year. And the second problem is that even if we do get all of those things, they don't last. Presents, presents break, don't they? Last year, my daughter Hannah got a lovely new doll for Christmas. And here's what it looks like now. Um, <laughs> its hair is all matted. It hasn't got any clothes or any arms. 
Well done, Hannah. Um, food. Food certainly doesn't last very long in my house, and we end up even feeling a little bit sick by eating so much chocolate that we just end up with wrappers all over the place. Uh, it's not very nice. Uh, and even um, a rest doesn't last. All too soon, we have to go back to school or work, and the fun and games at Christmas uh, end. I'm not going to be able to do that in time, am I? Right, great. And even family. After Christmas, we'll have to go back to our separate bubbles for a while. And even the best families aren't always happy, are they? The happy times with family don't last either. But today, we are looking at a passage which is all about joy and happiness. Happiness which lasts forever. Have a look at that with me. It's on the inside of your sheet as well as in your Bibles. In verse 42, when I say verse, that just means the little number. In verse 42, Elizabeth says that Mary and her child are blessed And that's a Bible word that really just means happy. She calls herself favoured in verse 43. Even Elizabeth's baby is jumping for joy in verse 44. Mary is rejoicing in verse 47. And she says in verse 48 that every generation will call her blessed. She is talking about a forever happiness. And I want to show you today that this happiness, uh, this joy is not just for Mary and Elizabeth and their babies... No, this lasting joy can be ours too, this Christmas and forever. So how do we do it? How do we have a happy Christmas? Two things we need to do. First, we need to trust God's promises. Second, we need to accept God's mercy. Let's look at those two things. First of all, oh, here we go. Uh, Yes, we need to trust God's promises. Let's hope that doesn't land on uh, Luke's piano anytime soon. Let's set the scene. In the first part of his book, uh, Luke, who wrote this uh, narrative, has introduced us to Mary, a young lady living in a small town called Nazareth. Mary has been visited by an angel, that doesn't happen often, who has told her that she is going to have a baby. Uh, Not the normal way you have babies, uh, with a husband. No, God himself is going to put his own son in her womb, and that baby will be called Jesus. And not only that, she is told that her cousin Elizabeth, who is quite an old lady actually, well past the age that you normally have babies, is going to have a very special baby too. And so Mary does the most natural thing in the world and she pays a visit to her cousin. Look with me, verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now notice what's going on. We have an old lady who's about to become a mummy and a young lady who's about to become a mummy and they get together in the countryside to a town in the hills for a little chat. Now, children, does anybody know or anybody else? Hands up if you know somebody who is about to become a mummy. No one, all right. You actually do, but never mind. Um, uh, Hands up if you uh, know two mummies uh, sometimes get together for a little bit of a chat. Have you ever seen that happen? Ever seen two mummies get together for a little bit of a chat? Yes. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Mummies talk to each other all the time. Daddies occasionally talk to each other, sometimes if they really have to, but mummies talk to each other all the time about everything, and that's great, because then the daddies sometimes have the first clue what's going on in the world. So this is a completely normal thing that happens all the time, all over the world. I bet all right now... There are lots of mummies getting together for a chat right now all over the world. So let me ask you this. Another vote. What do you think is the most important chat going on in our world today? Time for another vote. So A, Joe Biden chatting to Boris Johnson. Uh, Joe Biden is the president-elect of the USA. Boris Johnson is our prime minister. They are the leaders of their countries and they're on the phone having a conversation about what to do, how to lead well. B, a group of scientists talking about the vaccine. There are some new coronavirus vaccines, good news, and somewhere in the world now, some scientists are talking about them, making them safer, working out how to get them to people. C, parents' evening. Your teacher talking to your parent about you and what you've been doing at school. I had some of those this week. (laughs) Uh, Or D, two mummies having a chat about their babies. Which is the most important conversation happening in our world right now? Vote. Okay. Quite a lot of vaccine action. 
Some people like the politics. Yeah, I think the vaccine is winning out there. Excellent. That's very interesting. Actually, I don't, thank you. I don't really know the answer to that question. I don't know what the most important chat happening in 2020 is. Now, if I had to guess, I'd say it might well be happening between two mummies. That seems the most likely to me. But I know for a fact that this conversation between Elizabeth and Mary is one of the most important conversations ever had in the whole of history. Now, how do I know that? Because in verse 41... It says that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the Bible's way of telling us that Elizabeth is going to... What is Elizabeth is going to say next is going to be God's words. That's what that means. And so God has decided to use this chat between two mummies in the hills of Judah to say something to the whole world and to say something to us today. So let's see what God, speaking through Elizabeth, has to say. Verse 42. In a loud voice... She exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfil his promises to her. Another vote. You'll only need your A and B this time. Which of these two ladies do you think would normally be thought of as the most important of the two. Let me lay out the facts for you. Let's think about Elizabeth. Elizabeth is an older lady. She lives near the capital city, Jerusalem. Her husband is a priest who works right in the centre of the city, in the temple of God. And her baby is older than Mary's baby. She's just entering the second trimester, so she's been through the whole thing for the first three months. Mary is a very young woman, not much older than a girl, really. She lives in a small town in the north of Israel, far, far away from the capital, and her husband's a carpenter. So which one would normally be thought of as more important, A for Elizabeth, B for Mary? Yeah, easy one. You're very smart. Yes, Elizabeth, for sure, is easily the most important person normally, but look at what she says in verse 43. She says, why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She says, how come I have such this privilege to welcome you into my house? And notice that she calls Mary's little baby, my Lord. Even though Jesus is just a tiny, tiny baby in Mary's womb, Elizabeth says, and remember, God is speaking through her, that Jesus is her Lord and her God. And even, did you notice, somehow Elizabeth's baby knows that. Elizabeth's baby, who will grow up to be John the Baptist, knows that his Lord has come near. And verse 44, Elizabeth says, John is leaping for joy in her womb, which must feel odd. You see, this is the great news of Christmas, that God has come near. God is not far, far away from us, sitting up on a cloud somewhere, occasionally checking in on Zoom to see how, how we're all doing, and not really caring about what's going on in our world. No, he is the God who gets involved in his world. He rules this world day by day. He speaks to people and through people back then, through people like Elizabeth, nowadays through the Bible. And back at that first Christmas, he drew near in Jesus. God came to live as a baby and then a boy and then a man in our world. Now, actually, that could be good news. It could be bad news, depending on what God came to do, doesn't it? Maybe he came to tell us off. Well, luckily for us, Elizabeth tells us what Jesus came to do. Look at verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. This is what Jesus has come to do. Jesus came to keep God's promises. Now, let me ask you, children, have any of you been promised anything this Christmas? Have you been promised a new toy or a special breakfast? My son is holding up his hand. I don't know why. We've promised you nothing. But maybe you've been promised something nice this Christmas, a new toy, a special trip, a chance to see your family, a nice breakfast, a lovely meal. Uh, and perhaps your parents have promised you you can stay up late and, on Christmas Eve and watch The Muppets Christmas Carol as everybody should. Uh, now, I'm sure your parents and your, your adults are people who keep their promises. But very sadly, not everyone in this world is, is it? Are they? Sometimes people make promises and then they break them. Sometimes people let us down and they disappoint us and they make us sad. And sometimes we do it too, don't we? We say we're going to do something and then we don't do it. Children, how many of you have said you're going to do something and then not done it? I'm not going to ask for a vote. Thanks, thanks Ben. Yes, that's correct. Um, that's true. Well, 
God is not like that. He has made great promises in the Bible. He has promised that one day he's going to fix all the sadness in our world. He has promised that he would forgive us for all the wrong things we've ever done and thought and said. All our broken promises which cause such sadness in our world. He has promised that he's going to make a new world free from pain and suffering and invite people to come and live with him forever. And Jesus came to keep God's promises. He is God himself drawing near to his world to bring forgiveness, which he would do when he would grow up and die on the cross to take on himself all of God's punishment for our broken promises, for our sin. And Elizabeth says, Mary, you are blessed because you trusted God's promises. She listened to God's word and believed that he is going to do it, that he is the one who's going to fix our world, not us, that he is going to come to us in Jesus, and not that we have to try to get to him through doing good things. No, he is going to come near, and he's going to keep his promise, and he's going to forgive our sin, and he's going to make our new world. Elizabeth says, well, that is how to have a happy Christmas. It's by trusting God's promises, because God always, always keeps his promises. We need to do that Elizabeth and Mary tell us, and that is to accept God's mercy. Here we go. He is very good, isn't he, Freddie? Right, accept God's mercy. There we go. Elizabeth has spoken God's word. Now it is Mary's turn to sing God's praises. Look what Mary sings and says in verse 46. Ready? She says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Can you hear how happy Mary is? She says that ev- she's so happy that every generation, everyone in all of history will look back at Mary and say, wow, that is one happy lady. What a life she had. She was a real winner in life. Now, why is that? Why is she so happy? Why is she winning so much in life? Time for another vote. Who do you think is winning in our world. Here are your options this time. A, Jeff Bezos. Jeff is the owner of Amazon. He is the richest man in the world. He is worth $184 billion. I went on a website this week and worked out that for Jeff to earn what I earn in a year, it would take him 28 minutes. He's an extraordinarily rich chap. B, Vladimir Putin, who looks a little bit like Jeff Bezos, I found out this week. Uh, Vladimir is the president of Russia. He has been the ruler of Russia for 21 years, and this year he made a law that says he can be the ruler of Russia for his whole life, whatever happens, and he can do whatever he wants, which might not be a great law, but that's what he did. C, Harry Kane. Harry Kane is a footballer. He earns a lot of money too. His team, Tottenham Hotspur, is, I think, still currently at the top of the Premier League, and he is the captain of England. And D, Steve. Steve is a member of our church... He works for the council and he lives in a small house in Lancaster. So who is winning in our world? Let's see it. Brilliant, interesting. An inordinate amount of votes for Steve. Okay, it's tied between Steve and Harry Kane, which is not what I expected. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, Let's see what Mary has to say. Mary is so happy, she says that everyone for all time will think, wow, what a life she had. What a winner. Why? Well, look at the words Mary uses to describe herself. She says in verse 48 that she is in a humble state. That means she's lowly. She's not important. She's not a ruler or a leader or rich or powerful. She's nobody, really. Verse 52, she says again she is humble. Verse 53, she associates herself with the hungry, with people who haven't got enough to eat, with the poor, with the powerless, with the nobodies. And the key word as to why she's so happy is in verse 50, because she says his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, mercy is a word that means not getting what you deserve. It means deserving punishment and being forgiven. You see, Mary didn't think she was a good person who deserved God's blessing. She didn't think she was chosen to bear God's son because she was really important or powerful or special or good. No, she knew she was none of those things. She knew she needed mercy. And here's the key. 
That's why she is so happy. You see, if you get what you deserve, that doesn't tend to really make you happy or grateful or thankful, does it? When your dad or mum gets paid for doing their job, I don't know, perhaps, you, perhaps they do, but I don't tend to, write long thank you letters to their boss saying, oh, wow, I'm so happy. How did this happen? What an amazing gift. Thank you, thank you, thank you for paying me. No, they don't do that. They think, well, yeah, I did the work, so I deserve to be paid for it. But because Mary knows she doesn't deserve this blessing, that means she can have real and lasting joy because she knows now that God's love for her doesn't depend on what she has done. She doesn't have to be rich or powerful or successful or even good to earn God's love. It doesn't depend on her at all. It all depends on God's mercy and what he has done for her. That's why in our world, actually, it is people like Steve who are winning because Steve knows God's mercy. He has been forgiven and he didn't deserve it. So that means everybody like Mary or like Steve can be truly happy. What if you're not like Mary in this way? What if, though, you think you are good and important and powerful and you deserve God's blessing? Well, Mary says, actually, you're in danger. Look at verse 50 with me, where Mary says this. He ex- his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Time for our final vote. Which is your favourite piece of playground equipment? A, the roundabout, B, the climbing frame, C, the seesaw, or D, the swings? Let's have a little vote about that. What do we think? What's your favourite piece of climbing equipment? Uh, What do you call it? Playground equipment. Good. Yeah. No one voted for the roundabout, which is correct, because that's weird. Why would you want to make yourself sick? Um, Lots of swings... And a few uh, climbing frames. Brilliant, thank you. Mary's favourite, I know Mary's favourite piece of playground equipment. It's the seesaw. Do you see it? Do you see the seesaw in her song? At the top of the seesaw are all the rich and powerful of our world. And by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean the people who have loads of actual money and power. In verse 51, it includes people, everybody who is proud in their inmost thoughts. People who secretly think, we're okay. We're fine. We can do it all ourselves. We have everything we need. What happens to the people at the top of the seesaw? Well, what happens to people at the top of seesaws? They go down to the ground. They come crashing down. Mary says that they will be scattered, verse 51. Brought down, verse 52. Sent away empty, verse 53. And so what about the people at the bottom of the seesaw? The humble, the hungry, the poor. Well, they will be lifted up, verse 52. Filled with good things. Verse 53. And so what makes the difference between these two groups of people? How can you determine whether you're at the top or the bottom of the seesaw and what's going to happen to you in the end? It actually isn't all about how much money you have. We've already seen, haven't we, that it's about what's going on inside your heart. It's about the way you've treated God. Because verse 50, Mary says, God's mercy is for those who fear him. Now when Mary says fear God, she doesn't mean you know, cower in a corner in utter terror. That's not what fear really is in the Bible. Fear is about treating God as holy. Did you notice at the end of verse 49 that Mary says that God's name is holy? What does holy mean? That's an interesting word, isn't it? Well, let me introduce you to a holy object from our house. Here it is. This is the star that goes on the top of our Christmas tree. We put it on our Christmas tree for a good number of years now. It's not particularly impressive. It's made of a bit of metal and wood. Uh, So in itself, it's not anything special. But this is a holy star. It is holy because it is marked out and set apart from all the other objects in our house. It is kept in a special box in the cellar. And in between Christmases, it stays in there un touched it never goes anywhere near any dirt or grime or anything that would ruin it it's kept pure and pristine for one purpose and one purpose only and that is to go on the top of our christmas tree and it doesn't get used for anything else it's treated with respect 
as a thing devoted to Christmas tree topping. We don't use it to fix the tumble dryer or as a toothpick. That would not be correct. It is set apart for Christmas tree topping alone and also now sermon illustrations. Well, that is what it means, a little bit about what it means for God to be holy. It means he is set apart and special. He is pure and good and perfect. He's not like the rest of this world. He's better than us and bigger than us and kinder than us and more important than us. He is our creator and we're his creatures. He is the boss and we are not. You see, if we want to have a happy Christmas and a happy life, everything depends on how we treat the God who made us. If we think that we're really special, that we are good enough to live our lives well and earn our way into God's good books and get to heaven on our own and that we don't really need God anyway, then when we won't treat him as he deserves, we won't fear him and we won't trust his promises and we won't accept his mercy. And so no matter how high up we get in this world, one day it'll all come crashing down. But if we, like Mary, realise we don't deserve anything, that actually we've done wrong things and we need his forgiveness, and that Jesus is our Lord and the only one who can fix our world, and and he has come near to fix our world. If we accept his mercy and say sorry, and trust that he came to forgive our sins and be our Lord, well, then we can be truly happy. Yes, of course, there are going to keep being sad things in our broken world, and we will be sad at times too. But deep down, we can have joy. Because we know we've been given what we don't deserve and we can look forward to the time when God will lift up the seesaw and bring us into his brilliant new creation where there will be no more sadness or suffering or death. Well, let me conclude by praying a prayer. And if you want to pray this with me, think think about the words I'm saying and say amen at the end with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have come near to us in your son, Jesus. Thank you that he came to show us your mercy by dying on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. Thank you that you always keep your promises and you promise to bless those who trust your promises and accept your mercy. Please help us to do that now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.